In this second episode of the Alan Tejo Climate and Sustainability series, I'm speaking with winemaker and climate scientist Dr. Greg Jones, who has co-authored climate and wine research papers looking at the vulnerability of certain regions to climate change. One in particular that is relevant to this series, titled Climate Change and Global Wine Quality, published in 2005, states, Other regions currently with warmer growing seasons, i.e. southern Portugal, may become too warm for the existing varieties grown there, and hot climate maturity regions may become too warm to produce high-quality wines of any type. A couple of factors that are important in responding to this deduction are as follows. Mitigation is still essential. Every one of us, every business, every wine business, must play a part in the decarbonisation of human systems. Doing so is a collective responsibility that runs all the way through the wine business, from the vineyards to how wine is communicated and consumed. But this alone is not enough. Wine producers have to go further in building resilience, regenerating soils and ecosystems. This is as much about stewardship as it is about survival. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, recently released a report that states adaptation is critical because climate impacts due to human-caused global warming are now unavoidable. Here, Dr. Jones outlines some of the impacts we can expect in regions such as Alentejo, which are among the world's most vulnerable to heat increases and drought conditions. He also gives us his view on why regional certification programs, such as the Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Programme, play a crucial role in the sharing of knowledge, as well as providing the framework by which actions and progress can be measured. This second episode represents a broader view before we zoom in and meet the producers in Alentejo and hear their fascinating stories about the actions they are taking to boost resilience and protect the quality and reputation of the region. Okay, Greg, it's very good to speak to you. When you researched the Alentejo region, what were the climate conditions that defined the viticulture of that region? So the Iberian Peninsula is a kind of a mix of a little bit of uh, uh, maritime to a little bit of continental to a little bit of Mediterranean climate. And the the region of Alentejo is in the, um, the southern part of uh, Portugal. It's just far enough inland that it has less of a coastal influence. So it's a fairly summer dry, winter wet, but again, not quite so wet as it is in the north of Portugal or in Galicia. And can you talk about what your findings indicated would be a result of the heating based on projected warming scenarios that we're familiar with? Sure. So the framework by most Mediterranean type of regions, and clearly Alentejo is much more of a Mediterranean style area. Most of the areas worldwide that have similar climates are seeing a further drying of a seasonal climatic difference. So for example, having summer dry, winter wet kind of environments are becoming even more summer dry and slightly more winter wet. So what that really means is that the areas like Alentejo are warming during the summertime, less rain conditions during the summertime. So more dependent upon the soils holding moisture over winter into the summer. And we're seeing that uh, not only in Alentejo, but we're seeing it in areas in Australia, parts of uh, uh, South America and Chile and Argentina, and also in the Western United States too, that places that have similar kinds of climates. Okay, you've just highlighted a couple of impacts, but what are the potential challenges going forward that are going to really start being on the radar of producers and in, in an area like Alentejo? Well, I think one of the big issues, of course, is uh, uh, dealing with the events that are uh, challenging to grape growing. So what are, what are those kind of events? Well, number one, Heat events during the middle of the summer, of course, problematic. Uh, Not having enough water or during drought periods where water becomes even more scarce, being able to uh, hydrate the vines in any way, shape or form is is definitely a challenge. You know, I think that the other thing is is that we don't often, when we talk about climate change, we we don't often consider that, that cold events can become more problematic. And what I mean by that is, is that All of our observations uh, from a climate stance and and looking at the past data and also looking at the future modeling efforts show us that even though warming occurs, cold events don't go away. So what we think is is that the plant system becomes less 
used to those cold events. So, so for example, if you're in a region that used to have periodic spring frosts and you go through 20, 30 years without spring frost, and then you have one, that one spring frost could be much more uh, detrimental because the plant system is not quite as um, in tune to it. And I would argue also that the human system is not kind of prepared for it either. So once you stop experiencing something, then you're not quite as ready to deal with that. And we've noticed that even in places, um, you know, that have extreme winter cold, you know, like in uh, Niagara in Canada or uh, in eastern Washington, where winters can get pretty darn severe in terms of their cold. If it's not cold for quite a few years, then you have one event happen. That one event tends to be more damaging. So, so again, I think that there's issues on both ends of the spectrum. Severe events such as frost, potential for uh, more thunderstorms, um, hail events that are problematic. Uh, parts of Iberia doesn't get as much hail, but the, the potential for summertime hail events is greater in our modeling efforts moving forward. A warmer atmosphere has a tendency to, to create more intense thunderstorms uh, and potentially produce hail, heavy rain events. In the extreme sense, we, how substantial do you think these, these changes are gonna be actually on the style of wines produced in regions? Well, I, you know, I think extreme events are less uh, damaging to style uh, and they're more of a, a full crop risk issue. Um, you know, when we look at climate, you can kind of define it in three different forms. You, you look at individual events, extreme events like this, and that's really a crop risk issue. Then you can also look at climate variability and climate variability drives production and quality variations, uh, vintage variations, so to speak. But when we talk about stylistic changes, I think it's broad shifts in the longer term climate structure in regions that really play the prominent role. So, for example, if, if, if you're in a region that is, um, has been ripening a given variety, you know, right to its kind of margins or, or, or maybe even to its sweet spot, and you, you warm by one or two degrees Celsius, then what you're doing is you're ripening that variety to a very different stylistic standard. Can a winemaker still play that back to uh, maybe historical styles? It's possible, but there's always going to be a limit where if you... If you are growing a given variety in a climate that, that has become so warm, sugar levels are clearly going to go up as they have. We have really good evidence of this worldwide. And so as sugar levels go up, you, you naturally end up with a different style. You end up with bigger, bolder wines that potentially have higher alcohol, less acidity, a little bit different balance structure. So winemaking is a little more challenged. Okay, okay. And we also hear a lot about well, everybody's really talking about mitigation of climate effects by reducing emissions, um, this kind of whole sustainability drive, if you like. And it is obviously critical. But what are your thoughts on the need for adaptation and resilience building? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's critical. I, I think if you're in agribusinesses and you're not, you're not paying attention to um, what you're doing uh, relative to making a much more resilient, less vulnerable system, then you're going to be challenged in the future. So I think all of us need to be doing this. And, and you, know, uh, you know, agriculture is both part of the problem and part of the solution. I mean, that's pretty clear. And so if we can be better stewards uh, of our ecosystems, our terroirs that we, that we function in, then we can be a better part of the system in terms of mitigating climate change, but also reducing vulnerability. And so I think it's critical for every operation to have some sense of that relative to uh, wine production, but also production of other large broadacre crops as well. Okay. And certification programs in the wine industry are rising and trust in these schemes is obviously critical. What are the thoughts that you have on the need for these schemes in general and how they can best succeed? Well, you know, I think the, the, the various schemes, of course, that have developed have largely been either wine region specific or countries specific. And I, and I think that that's perfectly fine. But, but I really hope that somewhere along the way, we come up with some better global standards on this. The, the idea that we talk about aspects of conventional farming, organic farming, or biodynamic farming. I mean, that's all I think that's wonderful. But I think we really need to have better global standards. It's going to be a hard 
hard row, as we know, anything we try to do globally and standardizing is, is, is a challenge. So, um, so the, uh, I think the, the best thing we can do is develop regional uh, uh, schemes that really work for those regions, but tie them into a broader understanding and, and framework at the global level. There's, uh, there's fear of, of maybe over diluting the issue as well by producing too many things that people either can't achieve or it, it appears too complicated to even get involved in. Okay, and so you think that we're at a stage which is quite sort of embryonic in a way that we should be sharing knowledge much more broadly and trying to come up with a sort of universals, if you like. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely believe uh, sharing uh, knowledge across uh, the wine sector is really important. You know, if I figure out something I can do here in my vineyard, then why not share it with people in Alentejo? Uh, I mean, we, we all need to be better stewards. And if somebody can figure out how to do any one little component of, how, of our farming practices, our management practices, then we need, to, uh, we need to share that information as best we can. And some of the schemes that are out there are really doing that in a very profound way, both within regions, but also at a global level too. Okay, so what you're saying is that really, if we could share knowledge much more <laughs> dynamically, then that could actually feed into the whole sort of universal um, certification and, and you know, understanding of standards in a way. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Okay. And just finally, as a climate scientist and a wine producer, what are the main challenges generally for the industry that, that you see as you face the future? We could talk about what's happening in the vineyard. We could talk about what's happening in the winery, but we also need to talk about what's happening in the marketplace. And, and I think that one of the big challenges that we have moving forward is um, how to deal with moving a, a very heavy product around. Um, I mean, uh, the, I can go into a store here and buy wine from all over the world. And, and that's perfectly fine. But are there ways in which we can do that such that it's more sustainable in the long term? Uh, we, we, we know that glass is relatively sustainable, but, but, but to ship it around is a challenge. So can we come up with something that consumers are interested in purchasing a product in a different type of packaging that really allows us to be better, better stewards in that framework? Um, I, I think... I think expectations are kind of a real challenge. You know, it's kind of like if you look back at the at the move from using natural cork to screw uh, caps. I mean, the, initially when all that started, it was a pretty uh, a complicated situation, and, and yet here we are today, where that is a fairly uh, prominent use in the in the industry. So anyway, I I, I just think that that we have challenges in the vineyards. We also have challenges in in the winery. But we have to really be able to look at the marketplace, too, and, and inter integrate all of that together. So you think there's work to do? Because uh, what you're talking about is you know, there's a perception of a bottle of wine. And it used to be especially a perception of a heavy bottle of wine had some sort of correlation with quality. And if communicators and all these people that, that, like myself or others on Instagram or wherever they happen to be, yeah. were able to somehow communicate with the consumer in a different way, that we maybe yeah. that perception could change. Well, I think all of us are consumers and consumers in a, in a changing environment like we have right now, we need to be adaptable. We need to, we need to understand the efforts that people are doing uh, relative to uh, growing any crop, let alone wine, and, and what those efforts mean to us as a consumer. So we need to, we need to say, yes, we're, we're willing to adapt to, to new products and new uh, uh, frameworks behind production. Okay. I think I've got everything well, I need. Well, wonderful, Nick. I appreciate it. Uh... Thanks for listening. In the next episode, I'll be speaking to Ian Richardson from Haddad de Mouchel, a historic estate in Alentejo. Mouchel is an example of an integrated estate comprising vineyards, forests and grazing land with rich biodiversity and which, under Ian's care, is in the process of converting practices and adapting to new climate realities. Thank you for listening.